Hi folks, this is Jake. Hope you okay. I just want to uh, talk about uh, preaching and preachers. And um, hope this is a blessing to you and an encouragement to you. Um, and uh, I just want to talk about um, what is preaching um, and also I want to talk about uh, the preachers that have inspired me issues about preaching and um, I hope it's going to be a blessing to you and uh, it's more for seminary students who are interested in preaching and uh, just <coughs> so uh, so let's just pray Lord we just thank you for this day and we thank you for your love and we thank you for your grace and Lord we thank you for your care and we just give you the praise and the glory today and uh, we just thank you for your love today and we just give you the praise and we give you the glory we give you the honor and lord i just pray that what i share today father you would just bless for your glory and i pray that it would edify your people it would encourage them and that they would know your love and your grace and care in your name and for your glory. Amen. So I'm just going to uh, share what I know about preaching. Um, I have preached a lot over the years. I preached in Baptist, Methodist, Anglican, Evangelical, Pentecostal, uh, Methodist, uh, Anglican, you name it, uh, whatever denomination, Nazarene, uh, I probably preached in it, Congregational, Reformed, um, and I've written a dissertation on preaching for my uh, degree, so I have quite a bit of experience in preaching and now I do quite a bit of ex uh, street preaching. So I'm just going to share with you my own thoughts about preaching, what I think, what I've learned, what preaching means to me. And really I'm doing this for myself to get back to who I am because if you type in uh, a video, The Wounded Prophet, I don't believe I'm a prophet literally, but if you type in The Wounded Prophet, uh, you go on a, a channel called Atheist Examined, you'll get a a real s story of where I'm at, really. that That's a defining video that really defines me. And you'll get an understanding where I am. It's a very sad story, but it, it, it's a very redemptive story as well. And as you learn about that story, pray for me and support me in prayer, because... Um, I am under a lot of uh, pressure from these atheist. Um, and if you go on the wounded on the atheist atheist exam, and if you go on the uh, listen to the video, the wounded prophet, you'll know. Sorry about the phone call. So, sorry about that, they're talking down there, but, um, so I'm just going to talk to you about a passion of mine, and a passion that, that I need to rediscover, I need to, to get back to, um, if you can see there, right in that corner, right at the top there, is a picture of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. One of the it's that little white little 
darkish small one. That's a picture of Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones, and he's the principal reason why I became a Christian, really. I became a Christian because of Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. Um, I was going to a church and they were preaching uh, love, 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 and all the rest of it, but I felt there was something not quite right um, about the preaching because it, it, it didn't preach. That's Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones there. And the church was not preaching um, a full gospel. It wasn't preaching heaven and hell, etc. And, and I was this young lad. Uh, I'd been in a Young Offenders Institute for committing attempted armed robbery, and I'd, I'd just lost my way. And I came out, I went to this church, and these elderly folks invited me for dinner. And there were some books, and two of the books were two volumes of Lloyd Jones' Studies in the Sermon on the Mount, and another volume by Spurgeon, Sermons. And I took these, and I was in a bedsit, crummy bedsit, in the middle of some rundown area and I was reading these books and I thought whoo I've not read anything like this in my life this is something and I had a little New Testament from my uncle my uncle used to be in it was in a tank regiment in the Second World War and I had his New Testament and I was reading that King James and I was reading the life of Christ and there was something about Jesus I just could not get my head around but I knew that Jesus there was something about Jesus And then I met this reform guy, Calvinistic guy, called Keith. Um, and he was a great guy, and he introduced me to the Puritans. He introduced me to reform theology. And I learned about the reform faith and whatever. You, which there's some issues that I have with the reform faith, but it, it was a... It was such a blessing to me because it gave me a, a grounding. The thing is about the Reformed faith, it's very, very intellectually robust. There's a lot of intellectual theologians in the past that were Reformed. So when you begin to read it about Reformed theology, it really, it really does help you. It doesn't mean to say you agree with everything, but they can, they've been an enormous help to me. And in the midst of that, um, in the midst of it, uh, I, went, I was walking past a Christian bookshop and I saw a biography of Lloyd-Jones, the two volume. The second one had just come out. That was the first one. I saw the picture of this guy, and he looked really interesting. And he looked an interesting character. And I went and bought the book, and I absolutely devoured the book. It was about eight hundred pages. Absolutely devoured it. And then I found out that you could get sermon tapes of Lord John's. Now you can go and download his sermons online. And the person I knew, a friend of mine, actually knew Lloyd-Jones and had Lloyd-Jones come round for tea on a Sunday. And their father had actually organised preaching in Manchester and Lloyd-Jones used to come and preach, organised by my friend's father. And um, they had a little copy. I've got it somewhere around here. They've got a little copy of Lloyd-Jones' actual 
conversion story it's very rare I own the copyright now it's in my I've been given the copyright on it and it's very very precious and I I passed it on to the Lord Jones recording studio but it's a very very rare testimony of Lord Jones personal conversion and basically he said I was a sinner and I was saved by grace But the issue about preaching is Lloyd Jones was was a man of tremendous intellect, a man of tremendous humility, but the most of all a man of God. And I've never met anybody where when you hear him preach you're left with a sense of the presence of God. I would rather listen to Lloyd Jones one sermon than a thousand lectures of Richard Dawkins. One sermon by Lloyd Jones is worth all the work that Richard Dawkins has ever done and is more meaningful. So Lloyd Jones introduced me to the Puritans, he introduced me to biblical preaching, he, he, he but it was the main thing it was just the man was a man of God I knew that there was a living God through hearing him preach and in those days I didn't I used to think there was only one preacher and that was him but then I went on to learn that there are other preachers there are other gospel preachers dead and alive but at my when I was a young when I started out and I was going to church, I was decidedly uneasy because the church seemed anti-intellectual, it seemed anti-word of God, there was very little expository preaching, it seemed even anti-God, there was no sense of God's presence, there was no full gospel, there was no heaven and hell, and, and grace preached in the way that Lord Jones preached it. And I felt that the church had slipped, that there was something wrong with the church. I mean the evangelicalism and so Lord Jones really helped me and so I've, I'm my own man I believe in reading widely I believe doing your own studies but I've gone through two seminaries I've read Lord Jones's book here Preachers and Preaching and I've read, I, I've gone to two seminaries, I've listened to loads of people lecture on preaching. And I've listened to loads of lectures on preaching, and I've re read tons of books on preaching. I've read the key homiletical books on preaching it, that have been written that you need to read. I've read uh, Buttrick, which is probably the most difficult intellectual book ever written on preaching it's a it's about a six seven hundred page and it's absolutely very it was absolutely very difficult to read um, and in all that study and all those listening to lectures and things like Lord John's vision of preaching comes out on top the reason why it comes out on top is the last bit here His book trumps all books on preaching for me because he says this The demonstration of the Spirit and of power I have kept and reserved this to this last lecture which is after all the greatest essential in connection with preaching and that is the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit It may seem odd that I keep the most important thing of all to the end instead of starting with it my reason for doing so is that I believe that if we do, or attempt to do, all I have been saying first, then the unction will come upon it. I have already pointed out that some men fall into the error of relying upon the unction only, and ne neglect to do any, neglect to do all they can by way of preparation. The right way to look upon the unction of the Spirit is to think of it as that which comes upon the preparation. There is an Old Testament incident which provides a readily illustration to show this relationship. It is the story of Elijah 
facing the false prophets of Israel on Mount Carmel. We are told that Elijah built an altar, then cut wood and put it on the altar, and that then he killed a bullock and cut it in pieces and put the pieces on the wood. Then after done, after then having done all that, he prayed for the fire to descend, and the fire fell. That is the order. There are many other examples of the same thing. One of the most notable in connection with the account of the erection of the tabernacle in the wilderness in Exodus 40. We are told how Moses first did in detail everything that God had told him to do, and that it was only after he had done it all that the glory of the Lord came down upon the tabernacle. That is my reason for reserving what is beyond doubt the most important factor of all in the connection with preaching to the end. God helps those who help themselves is true in the connection as in many others. Careful preparation and the unction of the Holy Spirit must never be regarded as alternatives but as complementary to each other. What is this? It is the Holy Spirit falling upon a preacher in a special manner and it is an excess, a, excess of power. It is God giving power and enabling through the Spirit to the preacher in order that he may do this work in a manner that lifts it up beyond the, the efforts and endeavours of man to a position in which the preacher is being used by the Spirit and becomes the channel through whom the Spirit works. This is seen very plainly and clearly in the Scriptures. I propose therefore to look first at the Scriptural teaching and he goes on. It says, I indeed baptize you with water, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And he, he goes on. We read the Spirit coming upon the men assembled on the day of Pentecost at Jerusalem, and at once you see the difference that made to them. For Peter, who is craven spirit, had denied his spirit in order to save his own life is now filled with boldness and great assurance he is able to expound the scriptures in an authoritative manner and to speak with such mighty effect that three thousand people are converted under his preaching this was the inauguration as it were of the christian church as we know here in the dispensation of the spirit and that is the graphic picture we are given of how it began and the reason why lord jones stands out for me is this emphasis on the anointing of the preacher without the anointing without the Holy Spirit's help you can't achieve anything as a preacher Lord Jones wasn't anti-intellectual he wasn't saying you just go into the pulpit you just preach without any preparation he believed in vigorous preparation where you prepared your heart and mind through reading study but he never relied upon that he always relied upon the Holy Spirit there's a story of someone visiting the Lord Jones's and somebody wanted to go and talk to Lord Jones and his wife said she, she, you couldn't go and speak to him. And the person noticed that Lord Jones was on his knees praying, that he was a man on his knees in prayer. For Lord Jones it was about the Holy Spirit. He's a man who prayed and prayed and prayed and it was in that secret quiet where he prayed that the Holy Spirit then blessed him and anointed his preaching. And that's the greatest need of the hour. It's not apologetics. In the 1960s, in the 1960s, um, in, the, in Manchester, um, there was a lot of gospel preaching and a lot of people got converted in Manchester there were big rallies of great preachers coming like Lloyd Jones but later on in the 60s the preachers got clever and sophisticated and began to preach more apologetic sermons rather than actually just preach the gospel and the meetings went down and everything just died out because they're not relying on the Holy Spirit they're re relying on pure intellectualism and we need to get back to simple expository preaching not to be flashy not to be clever not to be sophisticated we 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 we're just as sophisticated as uh 
these uh, cultural theologians. We we read the Derridas and the Foucault and all that. We we read all that stuff. We know all about the various trends in hermeneutics and various trends in theology and biblical studies. But we hide that. We don't sh we don't display that. We don't display the scholarship when we're preaching. You keep that hid, and you just preach the word of God and you preach that and you magnify God. And that's what we need to return to, simple expository preaching. Let this do its work. This is the word of God. It is alive. And this will do its work. This is what God has given the church. He didn't give us uh, a manual in logic. He didn't give us um, t five proofs of St. Thomas Aquinas. He gave us this. This is what he gave us. He gave us the Bible. This is what he gave us. This is what the martyrs died for. This is what the martyrs at Lyons, uh in the time of Irenaeus, when people were arrested, where women were thrown on iron chairs, w which were heated up to the ninth degree. And then when they'd bur been burned to a cinder, they were thrown to dogs, and they were savaged and ate by dogs. And when there were some bones left, their families were not even allowed to take the bones. This is this is what they died for. They died for the word of God. They knew the four gospels were the word of God. They knew Paul's epistles were the word of God. They knew what the gospel was. And that's what they died for. That's what Perpetua died for. The lady who was taken uh, into the arena and there were these bulls and they went round and gorded people in the amphitheatre. And she still survived. And others survived. So the Roman soldiers went in and they killed them. Slashed them. And one of them was very timid Roman soldier. And tried to kill uh, Perpetua. And stuck the sword into his stomach. But because he was timid. He didn't stick it in hard enough. And she wasn't dying. And then Perpetua took his timid hand. Lifted the sword up to her neck. And then allowed him to kill her. That's what we have as Christians. We have a great her heritage of great martyrs. And they suffered for this. They suffered for the word of God. They didn't suffer for the five proofs of Sir Thomas Aquinas. I love Sir Thomas Aquinas. I think Sir Thomas Aquinas is awesome. I really do actually. Most Protestant people don't have not read Sir Thomas Aquinas, but if you wanna if you wanna meet a guy with an intellect as big as any thinker today, you go and read Sir Thomas Aquinas summer theologically because you're in the hands of an absolute master. You go and look at Aquinas' commentaries. You're in the hands of an absolute master. I think Sir Thomas Aquinas is, is awesome. I don't, I have nothing bad to say about the guy. But I'm just saying that God did not give us those things to rely on and trust in. He gave us this. He gave us the word of God. And you can use Sir Thomas Aquinas, you can use apologetics, don't get me wrong. It's not, it's not wrong to have apologetics, it's not wrong to give arguments. I believe in giving intellectual arguments, I believe that we should argue and defend the Christian faith. And I have spent five years debating with these atheists, and I have found, to my surprise, that these atheists are anti-intellectual, that they... When you actually confront them with arguments, when you actually say, well, will you have an academic debate with me? They, they run a mile. I've actually seen it with my own eyes. A, a whole generation of atheists, famous atheists, who have thousands of views, thousands of, who, who were respected in the atheist community, and they've been challenged by me to have an academic debate, and they won't have an academic debate. And when they do have a debate, they lose. I've had two, and they've lost. And they're not willing to have academic debates. They're absolutely useless. And I've seen that with good patient scholarship that there's nothing that these atheists or skeptics throw at us that we cannot answer. We have the answers. We have the truth. We have the living word of God. I've studied these atheist arguments for five years. I've read these major atheists like Sam Harris and Dawkins and all these people and I've read them and I've found their arguments pathetic. Their, their studies on, their comments on the historical Jesus studies is an absolute joke. So we've nothing to be afraid of. 
and and apologetics is a good thing i'm not i'm not knocking apologetics it's good to be well armed it's good to be well equipped but you can make you can rely upon that if you if you're not too careful you can rely upon that rather than rely upon the word of god rather than rely upon the holy spirit and i have done many videos and been in many situations where well as you you will probably find out i've made so many many mistakes with the atheists but also i've made a, a number of videos in the flesh not depending on the word of god uh, and not depending on the holy spirit and it's only the word of god and it's only the holy spirit can do its work i remember being in bolton a few weeks ago and there was a muslim young guy about 18 19 came up and he started discussing with me and i remember he, he was quite critical of christianity he, he thought he had his arguments against christianity and i remember just unfolding in the word of god and i could see the power of the holy spirit just convicting the guy the holy spirit was just convicting him i saw the power of the word of god at work in a muslim's life so the word of god is power it is powerful and and that's this is what god has given and the church is starving today there's a famine in the land there's a famine in the churches there needs to be a revival in preaching in the preaching of the word of god i have a friend and if he's listening i hope you're okay bro a colleague of mine who was at seminary who tells me that in the anglican communion a lot of it's all 10 minute sermons i know in the modern evangelicalism that i've been in recently where it's all trendy and rock concerts and all the rest the preaching is is very 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 weak very very weak it's like water it's literally like water and a whole generation of young people are being secularized in church because these people who mean well who want to bring a trendy christianity because they want to show that christianity is not judgmental but they dumb down the truth so much that they in the end these trendy youth workers end up secularizing their young people because their young people don't know anything they don't know the word of god they're not equipped in the word of god and if you're going to win a generation and if you want your young people to win the next generation you've got to equip them in the word of god they've got to be equipped look at the navigators look at what they achieved the navigators achieved what the na you go and google the navigators and go and look at the history of the navigators what the navigators achieved was absolutely stupendous god mightily worked through the navigators and what they were what they were students and academics in the universities who were christians and they would make a point in doing bible studies with students so students were studied the bible together this was in the 1950s so they would have little bible study notes kind of like uh these are not very good ones these are not the uh, these are uh liberal bible study notes so i wouldn't advise catholic liberal bible study notes so i wouldn't i wouldn't advise these notes uh, but they were kind of like these they were kind of like notes bible study notes like that the na navigators had and you can still get navigators material basically they would sit down with the students and they would just expand like the book of psalms the galatians and they would just ground the students in the word of god and get the students to memorize scripture and through that work the navigators they reached they they, they had a massive impact for good massive impact so from the 1950s 60s 70s evangelicalism where they'd got involved was absolutely strong it was strong it was vigorous it was evangelistic it was discipleship making it it was strong it was biblical and they had a big influence on the leadership of evangelicals uh, and they kept a strong vigorous work going because of grounding people in the word of god and and that's what we need to do that's what the church needs to do we, you know it's not good getting your sermons off the internet it's not good getting your sermon illustrations off the internet it's no good just going on 
on these um it's no good going on on these uh websites where you can download sermons and use them i mean come on this is this is life this you've been given the best job ever you've been given the best job ever and you're just messing about you're just playing games you're just fiddling while Rome burns. You go on your computer, you download uh, a sermon of somebody else's, you mishmash a few a bits of it up, you put in a couple of illustrations that you've got from the internet, and then you go and preach it to your congregation. for Not for 30, 40 minutes, but for 10 minutes. A little homily, and everybody claps your hand and, and smiles and says, Oh, wasn't our pastor lovely? Wasn't that nice? Christianity hasn't come to make people nice. It doesn't. It's not a nice club. It it's uh, it. it Christianity is about God. It's about God. It's about God, and 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 God's presence is an awesome presence. And there ought to be a sense of the presence of God in the church. And if everybody just goes to church and talks about football, I'm not knocking football or rugby or baseball or and you just go and talk and you listen to the sermon and then you all come home and nothing's happened then i'm sorry but it was a waste of time if you don't go if you can't go to church and be and and be excited about going to church if you can't go and be on the edge of your seat when you go to church if you can't go to church and say there's nowhere else where i'd rather be than at church well you shouldn't be at church you're better off going home and you're better off just doing your own thing. Go and play golf. Go to go and get a meal. Go and do something. But you shouldn't be going to church. And you shouldn't be preaching. If you are not preaching and thinking that's the greatest thing in the world that you should that can be done. If you're not going to church thinking it's the greatest thing that I can do. That I can go and worship my God. If that's not on your agenda then you shouldn't be going to church. You should pack it in. You should go home. And, and and a lot of you need to do that. A lot of you need to stop preaching and just go home and stop it because you're wasting your time and you're wasting everybody else's time. A lot of you people in the churches, you're wasting everybody's time. Christianity was never meant to be a social club. It is not a, <coughs> a social club. Christianity is a dynamic institution where the presence of God is. And the fact of the matter is the presence of God has departed in many churches today. God has been grieved. And that is where the preaching comes in. The preaching that you can tell the state of the nation and the state of the church when about concerning preaching. If there is no national preacher within the nation who's shaking the nation up, then that nation is, is, is in death row. It's in death. If there is no national preachers in the churches... Who, who are shaking things up, then the church is dead. It doesn't matter how many congregations you've got. There is no word from the Lord. There is no prophet in the land. And my friends, there aren't any prophets today. I'm sorry to say. I know there are good men. There are good preachers. But there are, there are no prophets today. There are no men today like Lloyd-Jones. There are no men like that. There may maybe one or two in America that are still left who are doing the work of God and preaching the way they should be but when I mean there are no men of God there are no men who are hearing from God as prophets I don't I'm not saying I'm not advocating that there are prophets and then there is the Word of God I'm not advocating that when I mean a man who is a prophet I mean someone who's spending time hearing God and is God's man who wants to know the heart of God for the nation who wants to know the heart of God for his church there aren't many men like that left there aren't many men like that left there is there is precious little if any men left who are hearing what God wants to say and that's because there is judgment on the church and judgment on the land when there is a famine of the word of God that is a, a sign of God's judgment and it's a God's judgment on a church that was apathetic in the 1980s and 90s in, in the West where the Western churches became materialistic and everybody was happy with their house, everybody was happy with their mortgage, 
Everybody chill, chilled out and calmed down and it was all nice. But now we're reaping a whirlwind. We're reaping a whirlwind of the famine of the word of God. And we're not hearing the word of God. We're not hearing the preaching of the word. There, there, is, there are few dynamic preachers who are hearing the word of God and preaching it in the church as it should be preached. I'm not saying that there aren't good preachers. There are some good preachers about. There are some preachers that are giving good messages about. I'm not saying that there aren't preachers like that. But the where are the Elijahs of today? Where are the John the Baptists of today? Where are the Isaiahs of today? Where are the Moses of today? And the Peters and the Pauls and the Latimer and Ridleys and the Baxters and the Bunyans? Where are they today? They are not around today. And they are not around because no one will get on their knees and say, God, I will do what you want me to do. I will preach what you want me to preach. Everybody wants to preach what they want to preach. They want to do what they want to do. They will not give control of the Holy Spirit. If you as a pastor, as a preacher, hand over control of your ministry to the Holy Spirit, my friend, there will be a revival within your church within a month, within a year. Be, your church will be so shaken up that you won't know what to do with yourself if you hand in control of your ministry to the Holy Spirit. And say, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to preach next week? Holy Spirit, what is your message to the church this week? And you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you His Word and to preach His Word and to magnify Jesus Christ. You do that and my friend, you will have more enemies on your back than Genghis Khan. You will have more enemies on your back than you have ever dreamed of. But you will have more blessing than you've ever dreamed of. You will be crucified more than you've ever dreamed of. If you think you've been hurt in the ministry now, you're going to be crushed like a grape. You're going to be pulverized because God cannot use you unless there is nothing of you. And you're going to have to go through the mill. You're going to have to be broken and broken because as the Spirit of God is taking control of your ministry and as He moves through you into the church, You've got to be empty. You've got to be nothing. You've got to go. And when the way he gets you to go is he breaks you in order to make you. He makes you nothing so that he can be something through you. And so as you hand over control of your ministry of preaching to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will crush you and break you until there is nothing left in you and then he can move in you through you into the church. And I tell you when that happens. People will get converted. People will get convicted. There will be repentance with coming within your church. There will be people coming in your meetings. And all they want to do is just pray. All they want to do is just confess their sin. All they want to do is just sit there quietly. And say Lord forgive me. And they'll get up and they'll say to the brother across the, across the church. I offended you. I said this. I said that. And they'll be repentance within the church and it'll spread within your region and it'll spread within the nation there'll be national repentance where people will be confessing the things that they've said and the disunity within the churches and it'll all be because you handed your ministry over to the Holy Spirit because you said Lord I give it to you but you're going into obscurity you're not going into the history books when this happens you're not going to be written in history as a great preacher you're not they're not they're not going to come and say oh this was a great Spurgeon this was a great Lord Jones that ain't going to happen to you when you hand over your ministry to the Holy Spirit and when you start to preach and God crushes you and breaks you in order to make you in order so that the Holy Spirit can work through you when he does that and people begin to repent and be, people begin to get saved it's not going to be written on the street like saying, great preacher. You're going down in history as a nobody, friend. You're going, out, you're going down in history as a nobody. You're going to be looked on as mad. You're going to be looked on as an idiot. You're going to be looked on as crazy. You're going to be looked on as an extremist. You're going to be hunted down. They're going to hunt for you. They're going to hunt for you. They're going to take you. And they're going to destroy you. 
You're not going to be written in lights as a great preacher. You're going to be hunted and they're going to crush you. They're going to break you. But all the time they're hunting for you and they're trying to crush you. They're trying to break you. Might be some idiot in your di diaconate. It might be some elders in your diaconate. And they've decided to get it in for you and to, to want to crush you. It might be some other churches in your area say come out against you and say you, they don't agree with this revival. It might be the government who don't want you to be preaching anymore and they will even lock you up, I don't know. But they're not going to come and say, oh, this is a great preacher. They're going to destroy you. And when they destroy you, they're not going to even think one second about you. But guess what? When you're gone, your ministry is still going to live on. You see, a preacher who preaches the word of God, in the spirit of God, that seed that goes out, it germinates. And sometimes in your lifetime, the full germination hasn't taken place. It's when you've gone. It's when you're dead that the full germination of what you said takes place. That people begin to grow in what you sold, in the seed that you gave, and God multiplies and blesses after you've gone. Because if you saw all the blessing, you would be puffed up with pride. But after you've gone, God blesses even more. All the words that you've said, all the sermons that you've done, people begin to study them again, and they be touched and changed, and, and they begin to bear fruit in their lives because of your legacy. And it happened to Polycarp, it happened to Ignatius, it happened to Irenaeus. All these early church fathers were just like the way you're going to be, or the way you are, or the way you can be. Where you hand up, they handed over their ministry to the Holy Spirit. And what happened to them? They were dragged before the emperors. Was it, I can't remember which one it was, Polycarp or Ignatius. One of them was uh, thrown, was put on a fire, set alight, and then he wouldn't burn, so they killed him. Another one was thrown to the lions. They didn't get any accolades. They didn't get any praise. They, they weren't written in the history books. They, in their day, they were seen as nobodies. In their day, they were destroyed. Then... When men thought they'd done their worst, when men thought they had crushed them, when men thought they had won, that's when God comes in, and God has the last say, and he raises up people, and through your testimony, and, pe and through, through their testimony, people were raised up, people saw Irenaeus uh, suffering, they saw Polycarp martyred, they saw Ignatius martyred, and the Holy Spirit worked in people's lives, and people got converted, and people got saved, and people got discipleship, all because of their ministry and their testimony. Polycarp's letters, Ignatius' letters, Irenaeus' letters were such a blessing to the church, and even to the day is bearing fruit. <laughs> God's army can't be stopped. God's work can't be stopped. It can't be stopped. But they handed their ministry over to the Holy Spirit. Irenaeus was in Rome, He'd left Leon, um, he'd left um, Gaul, the city, there was a city called Lyons, uh, that's the modern name, and there's an older name, and he had to go and send some letters to Rome, and he, he went to Rome and did some deputation there, but there was a massacre in his city, people, Christians getting killed, all because of the Gnostics, these people who wrote the Gnostic Gospels, all because they said that Christians sacrificed their children and eat them. And it was that kind of innuendo the Gnostics were spreading. spreading. Go and read the, 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 the uh, Gnostic Gospel uh, of Judas, and you'll find this kind of accusation in uh, that Gnostic Gospel. And Irenaeus is in Rome, and the church in Lyons is being persecuted because of this nonsense of the Gnostics. What does Irenaeus do when he gets back? What does he do? This is the kind of preaching that, this is the kind of pedigree that you should be following. 
This is the pedigree that you are called to be a preacher. What did he do? I'll tell you what he did. He, st he stepped up to the mark. He was only uh, a, cate a cate uh, He only did catechisms at the time. He was only a secretary at the time. What did he do? He stepped up to the mark. They appointed him a bishop. What did he do? Did he run? No. He stood in that city and he preached the word of God and he preached and he preached and he preached despite the persecution. He preached despite the fear of men. He preached the word of God. He did the ministry. That's the pedigree of the preachers that we have in our history of Christianity. He preached in the face of the most disgusting persecution that's ever been known to man in that area. It was despicable the kind of things the Christians went through before Irenaeus took charge of the bishopric, bishopric in that area. They put women on iron chairs and, bought, and, and made the chairs so hot that the women burnt. And when they burnt, after they burnt, they threw them to the dogs and the dogs ate them. And when the dogs had finished and there were a few bones left, they wouldn't even let the families take those bones. And Irenaeus had, was in Rome and his flock, his congregations that he was involved in teaching got massacred. And he goes back and he doesn't run. He stands and he preaches the word of God. And today his ministry still resounds around the world. Today there are still men and women that are inspired by Irenaeus. His brilliant book against the heresies is an awesome book. How he deconstructs the Gnostics. Absolutely. I was reading the reform writer uh, Shedd. Um, who wrote Reform Dogmatics. And, uh, and he wrote a book on the history of dogmatics. And he said in any age. Sip, um, Clement and Irenaeus. He named someone else. Irenaeus. They did such a great work. And they are to be commended. And Irenaeus studied the Gnostics and he studied what they said, but then he unfolded the word of God and he quotes time after time after time. He's quoting the four Gospels and Paul's epistles. He's quoting the scripture all the time. He was seeped in the word of God. But the point is, what I'm saying is, it was a ministry given over to the Holy Spirit. It was a preaching ministry. He went in his city and he preached the word of God and expounded the word of God. And he was not seen as important in his day. But his memory still lives on today. And he is now, he is written in the church history books. And he's written in the church history books. And he's remembered by the remnant of God. But well, guess what? He's not remembered by the academic world today. The academic world, when I mean remember, he's not honoured or revered. Whenever the academic world writes about Irenaeus, they love to give Irenaeus the boot. They love to criticise Irenaeus. They love to say about Irenaeus, oh, he was nasty towards the Gnostics. Well, Irenaeus said they were sexually deviant people. And he said a lot of things about them. But hey, if these Gnostics were spreading rumours that Christians were eating their kids and it led to Christians being massacred, I think Irenaeus was rather mild, don't you? And these modern scholars who attack Irenaeus, Irenaeus tells a story of a, of a lady who was involved in um, the, some of these Gnostics, uh, Marcus Magnus or Magnus Marcus or whatever um, these Gnostics would have these meetings and they'd be very sexually explicit kind of meetings and um, some women were taken in by this and went around with it with these Gnostic leaders and got involved in sexual shenanigans with them and one woman left her husband who was a deacon and went off with this Magnus Marcus or Marcus whatever and she then one day she realised she'd done wrong, she came back and she repented and she was upset about it. And Irenaeus tells a story. Now, flip back to today, these modern scholars will criticise Irenaeus. Say how bad he is criticising the Gnostics. It's interesting though, these feminist writers, feminist theologians, 
they'll write about any other women they'll defend the the cause of any woman in history they'll even defend the Gnostic Magnus Marcus whatever his name is they even defend him but they don't defend the woman who was taken in by the Gnostic into sexual sin they don't defend her honor in other words they'll these modern scholars will criticize Irenaeus for being biased but you can you can see the biggest bias ever concerning these modern scholars the point what I'm trying to get at is this so Irenaeus was a man of God he preached the Word of God he handed over his ministry to the Holy Spirit and he did a great work and even today he gets attacked in the academic world he's seen as a nobody in the academic world but his testimony is still having an effect today people are still being inspired by him and the martyrs the martyrs I mean I you cannot read the first 300 years if you can if you go read the Fox's book of martyrs and if you are not crying within the first 50 pages then there's something wrong with you because if you read the Fox's book of martyrs the first 50 pages is absolute the first hundred pages is just absolutely heartrending what the church went through it, it, if you need encouragement you go and read those Fox's bottom book of martyrs the first hundred pages I don't care if you're at the biggest I don't care if you're at Princeton University I don't care if you're at Yale Divinity School or Princeton Seminary I don't care if you're a professor of theology your Christianity is nothing I don't care if you do it, put in a bit of raccour, French philosophy and French hermeneutics in your theology lectures. I don't care that you put that into your lectures because they're nothing. They're nothing compared to Irenaeus. They're nothing compared to Polycarp and Ignatius. You lay down your life for the gospel and we'll listen to your lectures on raccour. We'll listen to your lectures on postmodern and feminist theology. But you won't, you've not laid down your life for the gospel. They laid down their life for the gospel. These martyrs were noble martyrs. They stood for the word of God. They stood for Jesus. And we'll stand with them. We're not going to stand with your clever theology. We're not going to stand with your liberal theology. With your clever smarmy ideas. We don't want them. We've studied them. They've nothing. They're nothing compared to Jesus. They're nothing compared to the Lord. And you can all flock to Biologos. And even you scholars who we do have respect for, like N.T. Wright and people like that at Biologos and Og Os Guinness, men who I greatly respect for their scholarship. But at the end of the day, Biologos and these people like that you can go to all that. We don't want that. We want this. We want the pure word of God. You can hoodwink people with your sophisticated hermeneutics and say, oh, we're actually getting back to the Bible. You're not getting back to the Bible. It's just sophisticated hermeneutics wrapped up in a way that hoodwinks everybody, making everybody think that you're getting back to the Bible. You know, like you, N.T. Wright, I, I respect you, uh, sir. You are a great scholar. And I admire you. I think I think what you have done and what you, some of the great work you have done has been absolutely astounding. But your methodology is basically Israel is your hermeneutic. Everything is is under that hermeneutic, and everybody thinks, oh, he's getting back to the Bible, and and he's getting back to the Word of God. All you're doing is using your particular hermeneutic. It's a sophisticated hermeneutic, wrapped up, made to be presented to people as if it's simple and you're getting them back to the pure word of God, but you're not. You're not. You're not. You're misrepresenting the Christian faith. You need to be honest. All the commentaries that you've written, all the things that you've written, are with a particular frame of reference, particular intellectual hermeneutic that you have that you think is important and that you made people think that is biblical but it is not biblical because it is only one part of the Bible and you've taken that as your meta-narrative to try and deconstruct a text so what I'm saying is this 
we need the pure word of God in preaching and I've gone round the houses but I, I'm just really really passionate about it that we're just in a mess we're in a mess we're in a mess the, the academic world in theology is an absolute joke it's an absolute joke I don't care I don't care if you're an MT writer and you've written massive tunes. I don't care who you are as an academic scholar. It's an absolute mess. We've departed from this. Academics are too bothered in theology. They're too bothered about being accepted as theologians and applauded by the academic world. They're too bothered about that. And they're not bothered about this. And they're not bothered about the church and the need for the church to be fed this and the need to produce preachers of the word of God that's what you should be preaching that's what you should be teaching as academics as professors of theology you should be producing preachers and if you're not producing preachers you're producing people who are going to destroy the church rather than build it I saw a vicar the other day a trendy woman vicar she had her hair all like a punk rocker and um, I've seen them before, you go into their house, they, they've not got commentaries, they've got books on Virginia Woolf, on feminist novels and stuff like that, and they think they're dead cool, turn up on a Sunday, give a little uh, ditty about love your neighbour and all the rest, and put in a few quotes by Virginia Woolf or some feminist theologian, and, and, and that's what it's all about, it, that's not what it's all about, it's about hard graft, it's about getting your commentaries out it's about getting the word of God and studying and asking the Holy Spirit to teach you and show you what he wants you to preach on and then you getting into the word of God and studying it getting your commentaries out getting your lexicon out Greek or Hebrew lexicon and studying the context of the chapter of the verse that God wants you to preach on and you grappling with it you're studying with it uh, John MacArthur spends I think it is it 40 hours a week or 30 hours a week or studying the Word of God a week and he studies the Word of God and when he gets into the pulpit he's got food to feed the flock and that's what it's about and and that's what we need to get back to we need to get back to that we, but above all we need to allow the Holy Spirit to work and that's what we've lost we'll, we've, we've lost the basic things in the church and in the academy and in the theological seminaries and I have to say that the theological seminaries in the UK are an absolute joke I have to say that the theological seminaries in the UK are an absolute sham absolute joke there are more closet anti inerrantists in the UK than there are closet gay people in the church and there's a lot of closet gay people in the church but there are a, an army of closet anti-inerrantists in the theological seminaries there's an army of them and they've been lecturing on theology for years in these theological seminaries and they don't even believe this is the full word of God they don't believe that this is the full fully inspired word of God they believe there are mistakes in it and these are people who, who write books and they lecture in our seminaries and have trained our people and our people come out, our young people come out, and they don't know which day, they don't know what day of week it is. And our churches don't even know what's happening. They don't even know there's been a crisis in the theological seminaries in the UK for the last 20, 30 years. There's been a crisis. There's been a massive crisis. And it's all been hushed, hushed. Everybody's hushed it up. Everybody's kept quiet about it. You don't want to upset people. Don't mention it in the Anglican church. Don't mention it in the Methodist, don't mention it in the Baptist, don't mention it in the Evangelical. Don't, don't, you'll upset people, or oh, don't upset people. But there's been a massive whitewash concerning inerrancy in the UK, in the theological seminaries. People have kept quiet about it and not said anything. Theologians who had great respect, great honour in the churches knew about the slide in the area of inerrancy and they never said a thing they never said a word they never sounded the alarm a few students did and they was quietened and shut up as fast as they could speak but there has been a massive 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 uh, hiding of the fact that there has been um, 
a crisis uh, concerning inerrancy and the inspiration of scripture within UK evangelicalism in the theological seminaries. And that's why we got all the theological nonsense that we got later on. That's why we've had uh, Steve Chalk uh, and and the same as in America, there's the same problem with inerrancy and it, full inspiration happened in America and it was never fully dealt with even when they had this inerrancy meeting in the 80s um, by uh, Montgomery Boyce and others and R.C. Sproul they thought they'd stem the tide but they hadn't they hadn't they hadn't stemmed the tide and the work went on on both sides of the Atlantic undermining the inerrancy in the theological seminaries and the re you reap what you sow and now we have an army of ministers in America and in the UK who've been ordained and they haven't got a clue about theology they don't know anything about theology they're not people who can preach the Word of God they are all over the place and they are causing havoc in the church because they're not teaching the Word of God they're giving the wrong teaching they're bowing to the secular culture that is calling for all these ethics that are not biblical and because the church hasn't got sound teachers the church is being left to the wolves and these people who have become ministers are just absolutely uh, collapsing the mainline denominations into nonsense and that's what's happening and that's all because over the last 20 to 30 years inerrancy was undermined on both sides of the Atlantic and nobody sounded the alarm nobody knew what was going on and even today nobody sounded the alarm in America and nobody sounded the alarm in the UK I'll tell you why because it was kept from people people didn't know it was happening people didn't know that there were these closet scholars evangelical scholars closet evangelical scholars who didn't believe in the full inspiration of the Bible you see what happens is if you want to be an academic and get your PhD you, and you want to be seen as a top academic theologian you've got to compromise with that you can't be famous and you can't be well respected unless you're seen as someone who is is quote tolerant and you're not going to be seen as tolerant if you say this is the word of God as an academic so you're going to have to say well there are faults in the Bible so that you can get your PhD and become one of the top theologians in the country and so evangelical scholars compromised and they began to doubt scripture and they took on the scholarship that criticized the Bible and then they fed fed it but in a very subtle way so evangelicals didn't realize what was happening in America and the UK and these new ideas were fed young people and they were not given the equipment to be able to discern what was happening and people in the churches didn't know what was happening and now what you have basically is theological confusion the emergent church and all the rest of it all the charismatic delusions that are going on it all comes down because we didn't teach this we didn't have preachers teach it and we didn't have preachers who were teaching in the seminaries it should be preachers that are teaching in the seminaries not seminary professors it should be pastors in the seminaries teaching the Word of God pastors who are missionary minded pastors who've done the work of God they're the ones that should be in the seminaries preach, uh, teaching about what it is to preach they're the ones that should be teaching how it is to preach okay boy I've been going on quite a bit so I know I'm quite challenging I know are quite confrontational but I think it needs to be you think that some home truths need to be said it's basically it's shambolic basically the evangelical world is in a shambolic mess and it's down to the theological seminaries that didn't produce preachers that didn't produce people who were anointed with the Word of God who were anointed by the Holy Spirit but they made scholarship of God they made the degrees in America they make degrees of the God you cannot get a pastorate in America unless you've got an MA in theology that is wrong that is totally utterly wrong that is not in the Word of God it does not say in this book 
you can be a preacher only if you have an MA in theology. It doesn't say that. You're a preacher if you're, if you're a man of God, if you walk a holy life, if you know the word of God, and if you've been tested in the church, and the church calls you, and the Holy Spirit anoints you, then you're a preacher. You don't have to have an MA in theology or a BA in theology. You don't have to have any qualifications in theology. All you've got to be is available, uh, that godly, and immersed in this, and preach this. This is all you need. This is all you need. And in America... America's dying. The country of America's dying because preaching has died, basically. And preaching's died. And it's died because you've made qualifications of God in America. You can't preach unless you can't be a pastor in the average church in America unless you have an MA in theology that is a recipe for disaster because you're going to get people in the ministry that aren't spirit filled it's not, and that's what you see so that's just about the general culture really about preaching um, so I'm going to stop it here and I'm going to do part two okay